Good evening and happy Sabbath. How are you all doing? Good to see you all again. It's been a while since I was last here. I know you've been meeting, but it's been a while since I was here. And I'm happy to let you know that um, we will continue the Bible study. Um, we'll be receiving new materials. I think from amazing facts. Um, the church said they would provide those materials for us. So we're going to continue to study God's word. And hopefully we can apply them in our lives. That's the ultimate goal. I just want to get into the message now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, have mercy upon me, Father. And have mercy upon these people who are gathered before me. Speak to us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of today's message is Word or World. Word as in W-O-R-D. Word or World. W O. R L D. Are you sure it's D? Okay. Word or world. If you have your Bibles, or better, let me say, get your Bibles. As I've told you, sometimes I've, not sometimes, I feel uncomfortable coming to worship and having to say, if you have your Bibles. I should be saying, get your Bibles, right? Or take your Bibles. Second Chronicles chapter 12. And our key text is found in verse 1. Our key text is found in verse 1. Before we take off on this flight, we're going to take a flight. This room is going to be the body of the plane. I'm just the speaker on the plane. Our co-pilot is the Holy Spirit. Our fuel is faith, the control tower is God, and our destination is at Jesus' feet. And we're going to fly at a very high altitude. This flight will only take 25 to 30 minutes. And before we take off, I need you to put your cell phones on flight mode so that we don't experience any turbulence. So if your cell phones are still on, kindly, I plead with you, with all my heart, please, if your cell phones are still on, please put them on flight mode. We don't want to experience any turbulence. I'm just the voice on the plane. The Holy Spirit is the co-pilot. Our destination is at Jesus' feet. Key text, I believe you've already turned them off. Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass when Rehoboam, who? Rehoboam had established, underline that if you can, when he had established the kingdom and had strengthened, underline that too if you can, he had established and he had what? He had strengthened himself that he did what? What did he do? Abandoned. My Bible says he forsook the law of the Lord. And here comes the terrible part. I almost wept when I read this. The Bible says, and all, not some, all Israel along with him. Isn't that something? The Bible says that this king, when he, Rehoboam, by the way, this is the son of Solomon. You've heard of King Solomon. This guy, Rehoboam, is the son of Solomon. And he comes in after his father, after the kingdom has been divided. The Bible says when he had established himself, this is when he was now, when he had established the kingdom, the Bible says, when he, everything was secure, he was sure that he was the king. He was now on the throne. 
And it says, and he had strengthened himself. He was now successful. He had achieved what he wanted. He had power. He had wealth. He had authority. He was now, the kingdom was established and he was strong. The Bible says, when this happened, when he was blessed, when everything was all right, he forsook the law of the Lord. In other words, he forsook the word. What's the title of the message? Word or world. When he was established, when he was strong, the Bible says he forsook the law of God. In other words, he forsook the word of who? The word of God. But the Bible says that he did not forsake it alone. He influenced not some, not a tribe, not a group. He influenced all of Israel with him. It is true. It is true that salvation is individual. It is very true. But we also have to recognize that we can influence others. And some people will be in heaven because of how we lived, because of how we behaved, because of how we conducted ourselves. The Bible says that all Israel forsook also the law because he forsook the law. I want you to look at verse 2. 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible says, And it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of what? Egypt. Came up against who? Against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against who? Against the Lord. That Egypt now was coming to punish them because they had forsaken God. They were being punished. And the Lord was the one who allowed this to happen. Now God loves Israel. God loves his church. And the last thing that God wants for the church is for the church to suffer. The last thing that God wants for you is for you to suffer. The last thing that God wants for you is for you to go through pain, for you to be sick. And sometimes people, when they suffer, they say, where is God? Why is God allowing this? Some say, why is God doing this to me? But if you look at verse 1, what is happening to them is a result of them abandoning God. It was not God who said, let me go and punish them. But because they forsook God, because they forsook the word of God, they placed themselves in danger. Because they were no longer requiring a thus saith the Lord, instead they were requiring a thus saith the world, and not the word. Things we're going wrong. And if we want to survive as a society and as a church, as an individual, if we place aside the word of God, if we place aside the law, then we shall not prosper. Now, God had warned them about this. I want you to come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. We're going to start, hmm. let us begin in verse 14. Let's begin in verse 14. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. We'll read 14 to verse 20. Verse 14 says, this is God speaking. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you. No, this is Moses speaking. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. When they were going through the wilderness, they were headed to Canaan, the promised land, and God was the one leading them. 
Through Moses, God says, when you get to the land, in other words, God was telling them, listen, I'm going to let you go through the wilderness. I'm going to provide for you. And though you are not there yet, you are going to be there. And God is telling them what's going to happen there because of their stubbornness. Because they were departing from God's word, God saw what was going to take place. And so God says, through Moses, in verse 14, when you get to that land, you are going to ask me to set up a king for you. I'm going to repeat what verse 14 says. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it and dwell in it, this is what's going to happen. You will say, I will set a king over me. In other words, when Israel gets there and they are finally there, they are enjoying the blessings. This is what they will do. They will say, we want a king like the other nations. So the reason why they're going to ask for a king is because they want it to be like who? Like who? Like the other nations. In other words, they want it to be like the world. They want it to be like the world. We want to be like the other nations. Give us a king like the other nations. And they said, a king who will go before us. A king that we can see like the other nations. By that time, God was their king. So they were saying, we want to be like the world. God did not stop them. You know, God sometimes will give us certain things, not because he wants to give us, but because we insist. The Bible says that God gave them the king, but Hosea says he gave them a king in his wrath, and he removed the king in his wrath. You know who this king was? It was King Saul. It doesn't end there. If you look at verse 15, the Bible says, You shall surely set a king over you, whom the Lord your God, what? Chooses. So this is what happens. They said, we want a king like the other nations. We want to be like the other nations. God said, is that what you want? That's all right. But let me at least choose whom. If you continue to read in verse 15, it says, One from among your brethren, you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brethren. Verse 16. But he, but he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to what? To Egypt to multiply what? Horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way. Psalms 20 verse 7 says, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. God said, all right, if that's what you want, you want to be like the world, go ahead, I won't stop you. If you want a king like the world, as long as he is from your brethren, but he should not multiply horses for himself. Look at verse 17. Why is God saying all of this? Let's continue to read verse 17. Neither shall he multiply what? Wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. For himself. God is saying in verse 16, he should not multiply horses for himself. Huh? And then in verse 17, he should not multiply wives for him, what? Self. Verse 18, also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a what? In a book. 
from the one before the priest, the Levites. God is saying this. The king must not multiply horses lest, and it says he must not multiply for himself, lest he becomes proud of his possessions. He should not multiply wives for himself lest he turns away from the Lord. His focus must be on the law. And it says that the king must rewrite the law in a book and he must meditate on the law. Let's continue to read. Come with me in verse 19. The Bible says, after he has taken the law and has rewritten it in a book, this is what he must do, verse 19, and it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his what? Life. He must write the law in a book, he must rewrite it, and it must be with him. He must have it. It must be his. And it says he must meditate on it all his life. Not only during midweek. Not only during Vespers. Not only during Saturday, but he must meditate upon that book, the Word of God, for all his what? All his life. Every day he must meditate on the Word of God. Because this is the only way that the king will remain faithful to God. He must meditate on the Word of God. And he must not depart from it. The verse goes on to say, that he may learn to fear the Lord. In other words, if we do not meditate upon God's word, we cannot learn to fear the Lord. He must learn to fear the Lord, his God, and be careful to observe. In other words, he must not just rewrite it. He must not just know it. He must not just meditate on it, but he must apply it in his life he must observe and it says all the words of this law not some not half of it not only four or obey only nine and leave out one he must obey all of it verse 20 that his heart here it is that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren in other words so that he may not be proud this means that you cannot avoid being proud if you are not daily meditating and seeking to apply God's Word you cannot be Christ like if you are not meditating on God's Word every day the Bible says that he must meditate all the days of his life today is the Sabbath we are worshiping God. A Seventh-day Adventist is not a person who only goes to church on the Sabbath. Is not a person who only reads the Bible on the Sabbath. Is not the person who comes to seek only the Spirit in church on the Sabbath. A Seventh-day Adventist is someone who's not going to church to be filled because he hasn't been filled the whole week. The Bible says we must meditate. A Seventh-day Adventist meditates upon God's Word Sunday to Saturday. So when he comes to church, he is not dying out of thirst and hunger for the Word. He has already been reading. He has already been meditating upon God's Word. And on Saturday, he just or she comes to church to meditate and to pray with the others. A Seventh-day Adventist is not someone who only prays on the Sabbath. It is someone who has been praying throughout the whole week. And Saturday, they come to pray with fellow brethren. The Bible says that the king must meditate all the days of his life. Verse 20, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren that he may not turn aside from the what? From the what? From the commandment to the right hand or to the left. 
and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his what? And his what? Children in the midst of where? In the midst of where? Israel. So when he does this, when he meditates upon God's law and upon God's word and has it with him and he seeks to apply the word, the Bible says, he and his children in the midst of Israel, meaning that the word will transform him. And as he meditates and as he prays, he's going to be transformed and he will have a character of Christ. He will be Christ-like. And because he will be Christ-like, the Bible says he will influence his children in the midst of Israel. I want you to come back to Second Chronicles, chapter 12. Second Chronicles, chapter 12. Uh, we're going to repeat verse 1 and verse 2. We've read what God had instructed them, telling them that when you go there, you're going to ask me to allow you to have a king because you want to be like the other nations. You don't want to follow the word anymore. You want to follow the world. What is the title of the message? Word or world. So God said, okay, have a king. As long as this king, he must have the word. He must meditate on the word all the days of his life. Not just meditate, but he must seek to apply it. And if he seeks to apply it, and applies the word, he will influence Israel to follow the Lord also. Now, in Second Chronicles, we've read this. I want us to read again. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Verse 1. Now it came to pass, when Rehoboam had established the kingdom, and had strengthened himself, that he did what? He forsook the law. What God had said, you must not forsake. He forsook that law of the Lord and all Israel along with him. This is terrible. Israel is the church. Because of this one man's influence, the whole church went into apostasy. The whole church departed from the law. Influence is very powerful. Verse 2. And it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had what? Transgressed against the Lord. The reason why this nation came against them, it was a punishment for their sin. Now God does not love punishment. The Bible says that God is not pleased with the death of the wicked. And that God wants everyone to be saved. But because they have transgressed, you see the moment we depart from God's word, the moment we start disobeying God's law from the first commandment to the last commandment, we are destined for destruction. Verse 3, the Bible says, With, with 1,200 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people without what? Without number, who came with him out of Egypt... The Lubim and the Shukim and the Ethiopians. Verse 4. And he took the fortified cities of Judah and came to where? To Jerusalem. This is amazing. I'll tell you why. Verse 5. Then Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam. This is the good news. Whenever there's apostasy, whenever people abandon God's law, and the love of God amazes me, God always runs after the people. 
God always pleads with them and he runs after them to bring them back. The Bible says in verse 5, Then Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah. They were the ones who had fallen. The devil seeks to destroy the church. What he does is he begins with the leaders first. He begins with the king as we see in this story. He begins with Rehoboam and through Rehoboam he gets the church. He begins with the pastors. He begins with the elders. He begins with the deacons and deaconess. And when he gets them, he moves on to the rest. The Bible says that this prophet went to Rehoboam the king and the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak and said to them, this is what he said to them, thus says who? Thus says who? The Lord. You have forsaken me and therefore I also have left you in the hand of who? Shishak. So God is saying, I have not forsaken you because I decided and purposed in my heart that I want to leave you. The problem is not with me. The reason why you're facing that issue, and many of us, we face certain things because we are the ones who chose to face them. From the moment we stop praying, from the moment we stop reading, we wake up and we rush out of our rooms. We are rushing out without the Lord. And when we do that, we are placing ourselves in danger. And this is what happened with these people. Thus says the Lord, you have forsaken me. And therefore, I also have left you in the hands of Shishak. Verse 6. So the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves. And they said, the Lord is what? The Lord is just. The Lord is righteous. In other words, what is happening to us, we deserve it. It is our problem. It is, it is our fault. We are being attacked because we have sinned. God, has not, God is not the one at fault. It is us. So they say the Lord is righteous. They humbled themselves. Let me tell you something. It does not matter how far you have gone. If you humble yourself before the Lord, if you recognize that you have sinned, you have transgressed God's law, and let me tell you something, there is no excuse to sin. There is no excuse to break God's law. But if you have broken it, my friends, Humble yourselves. The Bible says they humbled themselves and they said the Lord is righteous. Verse 7. The Bible says this. Now, when the Lord saw, when the Lord did what? When the Lord saw that they did what? That they humbled themselves. They recognized that they were at fault. The word of the Lord came to who? Shemaiah saying they have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not do what? Destroy them. But I will grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem, excuse me, by the hand of who? Shishak. God is not saying they will not bear the consequences. God is saying, I'll forgive them. I'll forgive them. But they will bear the consequences. Some people say, God is forgiving anyways. I mean, let me just do this. God is love. God is kind. God is patient. That is very true. He is. But God is just also. He will forgive you. But you're going to bear the consequences so that you can learn and so that you don't do it again. So God says, I've heard. I have forgiven. But the punishment will not come through Shishak. Verse 8, God says, Nevertheless, 
they will be his servants. In other words, they won't die anymore. Because I've forgiven them, I will not allow Shishak to kill them. Instead, they will be servants. And it goes on to say that they may distinguish my service from the service of the kingdoms of the what? Of the nations. They wanted to be so much like the other nations. They forgot about God's word. They ignored it and they put it aside. So God said, let me show them how the other nations do it. I will allow them to go under slavery. Verse 9. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. God didn't stop it. God forgave them. And God did not allow Shishak to kill them. But God allowed Shishak to take them under slavery. And if you read in verse 9, it says, And he took away the treasures of the house of who? Of the Lord. And the treasures of the king's what? House. He took what? Everything. He also carried away the gold shields from which Solomon had made. God even allowed that the treasures, treasures from his house be taken away <laughs> just to teach them a lesson. God allowed it that even the treasures from the, from the church, from his house, be taken away. God didn't want that. It's his house. Those are his treasures. But God loves them so much He's willing to let the treasures from his house, from the church, be taken away as long as they will learn. As we close, I want us to look at verse 12. The Bible says, When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him. So as not to destroy him what? What does it say? To destroy him completely. And things also went well in what? In where? In Judah. After they had abandoned the word and they chose the world. After they no longer required a thus saith the Lord. But a thus saith the world. After they humbled themselves, when they were told the truth, after they humbled themselves, God forgave them and everything went well. Verse 13, Thus King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. Now Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Nama and Ammonites. We have three verses left. We're almost at the end. Verse 14 says, And he did evil. Because he did not prepare his heart to seek who? To seek the Lord. The reason why he fell, the reason why Israel had fallen, the reason why Israel was no longer successful was because Israel had forsaken God. The Bible says he did not prepare himself to seek God. In verse 1, it mentions that when he had established himself, that when he was strong, he forsook God. And if you look in verse 14, it says he was evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek God. Let me tell you something. God is not calling you just to give you blessings. God doesn't want to be your friend so that you can only call him when you are in trouble. Not only when you have an exam, 
or when you don't have money in the pocket or when there's a typhoon coming you know some people become very religious during typhoons you see people on Facebook they never posted anything about prayer or about God but you find very long prayers on Facebook when typhoons are coming some people become very humble when danger is coming when there's no food at home or when the salary did not come on time people pray a lot but when the salary comes when the typhoon is over and their house has not been destroyed oh they forsake the law of the Lord they forsake God and the Bible says he was evil because he did not prepare himself to seek God this means he was not seeking God he was seeking what God can give him huh because the Bible says when he was established and when he was strong he forsook God meaning the reason why he was seeking God was for him to be established it was for him to be strong and so when he was strong he no longer needed the Lord and so he departed from him and when he saw that it was it was dangerous to live in this world without God when he saw the trouble was coming he went back to God and this amazes me that God was waiting for him with open hands and God received him and God forgave him but he had to recognize that he was wrong he had to recognize that he needed the law that he needed a thus saith the word and not the world let us look at the last two verses verse let's go to verse verse 16 so Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David then Abijah his son reigned in his place so this is the story of Rehoboam as we close I want to ask you a question what if your story was written down for people who are gonna come after us what if there was another book that was written down let's say another Bible and there would be a chapter just for your life about you what type of message would that book give to the world would it encourage people to seek God or would it encourage people to leave God think about it think about it when we depart from God's Word we're in danger and what the devil seeks to do in these last days is to lead the church from God's Word because once he does that it's chaos once he leads us away from the law and by the way this law is the same law that was uh, being used to govern in heaven and the devil in heaven said that we don't need the law angels don't need the law hmm? we don't need the law we should live without the law God is not ruling right and down on earth he's doing the same thing he's trying to lead us away from from a from keeping God's law from obeying the word from meditating on the word of God sometimes he makes sure we're too busy to read the Bible or sometimes we only give a couple of minutes to the word or even to prayer in the beginning we were with God sin separated us from God Jesus Christ has come to reunite us to restore us to reconnect us back to God communion with God 
And the only way is by remaining with the word of God. The only way in these last days is requiring a thus saith the Lord and by maintaining a connection with God through prayer. That's the only way. If we depart from that, destruction awaits us. But there is time for us if we have departed to return back. When they asked for a king, God allowed them. Sometimes people say, well, if this happens, it's because it was according to God's will. It wasn't God's will for them to have a king. They pleaded and pleaded. They insisted. God said, okay, go ahead. God in the wilderness wanted to give them only manna. They said, we don't want this manna. God said, okay. And he allowed them. Let us stick to the word of God. Let us stick to the word and not to the world. I pray that God may bless you and that you may meditate upon God's word. You may seek to have a connection with God. Don't go to God because you want blessings. Don't go to God because you want things from Him. Go to God for God Himself. Have a relationship with God. Commune with God throughout the day. May God bless you. And may God keep you. Amen.